Ladies and gentlemen, I might be willing to agree with side opposition if I thought that constitutions genuinely represented the moral truth of the matter, that they could always be applied with the full support of all of the people <coughs> and the council of wise men from a particular ethnic group or a particular class group could always accurately and positively tell us what was contained within this like, moral truth that they had. Given that none of these things hold, that the constitutions were written by certain framers in a certain time in certain groups of particular interests, it doesn't protect everybody. Because judges come from a certain generation, a certain group with certain interests, it doesn't protect everybody. And for these reasons, and finally because we don't think that people are always going to just buy into whatever it is that the constitutional court like rules, for these reasons I am very proud to be on side of government. What am I going to talk about today? First, I'm going to talk about why there's no particular reason to think that constitutions are particularly good or better at protecting groups than like, the people as a whole. And second, why it's particularly important in newly democratic countries where you need to have the population recognise that this is like a that democracy is a good thing, that it's something which is reflecting their views, and is simply not an overhang of the old system, and to get them to buy into it. Uh, no, thank you. Before I move on to that, I'm going to respond to some of the things we heard. So, one, one idea that we got from uh, opposition was that on their side they get more debate because people say, oh, this is unconstitutional, that's weird, maybe we'll talk about it. Actually, we get more debate on our side, because on their side, the debate you get between groups who are buying over whether you should have, say, abortion rights, don't need to talk to each other. They don't even need to advance the real arguments why they think that rights for abortion are a good thing. They advance legalistic arguments. So they don't even properly represent what their views are, and they don't have to talk to each other at all. On our side, when you then get that referendum, it means they actually have to engage one another. They actually have to say, here's why we think it's really important. Why the people have this one No, thank you. And so that, we get a much richer debate, one where you actually get dialogue, and where you get the actual issues being discussed. So this is good for a couple of reasons. One, for all the reasons the opposition told us that it's a good thing to have debate. But second, it also reduces tensions between sides when you actually understand the problems that a certain minority group are facing. We think this protects rights more in the long run. Because if, if some people say, actually, yeah, maybe it is important to have abortion in certain cases, then it means that you don't have the situation we have at the moment. They have a polarised judiciary, a polarised population, where they're constantly trying to get like, certain measures passed which bypass the constitution in lots of clever and nasty ways. So, like, for example, in the southern states, they have horrible invasive procedures to try and convince women not to have abortion. They say, yeah, it's just about constitutional, we're allowed to do that. Instead, if you get this understanding, it means that people don't try and bypass the constitution, and you get a much better protection of rights in the long run. Um, so like, that, that's like most of my hands across. Sorry, well, yeah, I'll take crap. But, but the point about Roe v. Wade was that there were some states in which you literally could not get an abortion at all before it was passed. So, that's an net positive. So, 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 so interestingly, if, if by the time that Roe v. Wade came along, abortion rights were already overwhelmingly popular. Roe, the Constitutional Court, came behind the population of the United States. Only about half a dozen states still had laws against abortion at the time, and there were already proposals coming in in order to change those rules in those states. The Constitutional Court reacted very late. They refused to listen to any abortion cases for about 20 years before it because they thought it was too controversial. This is a case where the people are more progressive, no thank you, than the court. So then moving on to like, my first point, there's no reason to think that constitutions are particularly good. This is the three like, general reasons. Framers have no special access to moral truth because they were written at a particular time, and judges who interpret it from a particular background. So the first, like, so the first point here is that like, generally speaking, as a group, I don't think we believe in like, a council of wise men who can work, work out exactly what perfectly like, the correct rights of a certain group is or is not. This skepticism is why generally we're liberal, where we let people lead their own lives, because we say we don't think we know what's best morally for you. It's also why we're generally democratic. We don't have this council of wise men, as you do in some countries, saying these are the true moral principles we should be aiming for. We'll let our civil service, you know, thank you, maybe like, work out the means to them, but we don't think people are any good at working it out. Given we allow democracy in every other area, it's not clear why here, just because of a historical accident, that some countries really did believe in the Council of Wise Men when they set up, but we still let this idea of Council of Wise Men continue. But not only does this apply only from an abstract level, but it applies very specifically. Framers often represent a certain class and certain interests. In the US, in Australia, that means like middle class white men. When it comes to like newly developing countries, it's usually like the victor ethnicity, whichever country we're talking about. So for example, like with the constitutional court in in uh, Egypt, for example. No, thank you. So this means they and they also represent a particular generation. It's not clear that what the Council of Wise Men thought in the 18th century is particularly true for morality or protecting minorities. Yeah, so that people people, no, thank you, are more likely to represent all interests than the framers who represent a particular interest. 
interest at a particular time. And so as we were raised in the POI, in many countries, like the, the constitution simply doesn't protect certain minorities. We were talking about just racism when we said this. No, we have some examples. In Papua New Guinea, they said that minorities in the east of the country have no specific protection under the constitution. Similarly, when we're talking about like Sri Lanka, the constitutional court rule saying the Tamils have no special protection under the constitution, there is no reason to recognize differential rights there. These constitutions in more newly democratized countries more specifically ignore ignores certain ethnicities because the court is overwhelmingly made up of the dominant ethnicity. Even though the minorities we accept are going to be shut out in some way, they're still a minority, at least they get some voice in the decision, unlike on their side, where they're just not represented in the courts and get absolutely no voice in the decision. So like, and also on this idea that maybe, maybe like courts are more progressive than the people. So this is just factually untrue. Like the US Constitution includes the Three Fifths Compromise, for example, which says that black people count specifically for three fifths the worth of a white person. This is like obviously, like obviously nonsense. When the people even started rejecting it only, only 30 years after the Constitution was passed, it takes another 80 years for it actually to go because it's so difficult to change the Constitution. When the Supreme Court struck down New Deal policies, it's, it, struck, it kept slavery constitutional even though the people were against it. It's just not clear empirically that courts are much more likely to protect rights than others. And finally, in newly democratic countries, when you have people who are saying, right, we need to buy into this idea of democracy, this is what we've been fighting for, that our views get represented. Instead, they pass an elected like, law, elected uh, or whatever, through their representatives, and it's struck down by the court. It means that, one, they don't think that democracy is actually working, it's not representing what they say. Two, it just looks like dictatorship again, quite clearly. Three, the courts are usually filled with people associated with the old regime, because they're the people who are most educated in the system, they naturally get elected. Like, that's what happens in Egypt. The, con the, the constitutional court is basically all the same people, the old cronies of the back. But finally, um, it means the courts are much more easy to corrupt than the people, because you can bribe them, you can intimidate a court of nine people. It's much harder to bribe, much harder to intimidate like, an entire population, which means that like, the people are much more likely to make better decisions. And if, and if the court then strikes it down, they're not going to find crazy, and they're probably just they're not going to support it, and may even return back to the old conflicts they went to when they said, we want to fight for democracy, we don't have it, we want to fight for it again. Because we want to protect democracies in newly democratic countries, because we want to